everybody. So um, thanks for coming tonight. I know it's required, but thanks for being <laughs> here anyway and moving up closer. Um, I'm going to be like moving a little bit. This light is killing me. <laughs> so if I just, I'm not looking at you guys so much. Um, as Max said, we have um, gone back a ways. And when he reached out to me this summer to come participate in the series, I was delighted. Uh, and I also started the way my brain thinks. It's like, wow, you know, how did I first meet Max? You know, when did we meet? And it's not a romance story. <laughs> it's a work story. But Max and I uh, were office neighbors. So we worked in a creative complex in Venice, uh, which was, you know, still in its authentic days off at Abbott Kenny before Snap moved in. And uh, I remember we would kind of move back and forth. There were these uh, small creative loft spaces and Max was just starting his company. I was uh, just starting at a startup at the time. And um, we would just kind of bring our coffee over and shoot the shit and talk about what creative projects we were working on, what challenges we were facing. And it ended up that the company uh, partnered and hired with Max and his partner to help us reimagine an exhibit booth space that the company wanted to redesign. And I started thinking about what that process looked like. Um, you know, we would have several meetings and, and Max and his partner would come in and, and, you know, start asking questions about, well, what's the brand about? You know, and, and what is it that you do? And what is it that you're saying? And how do you want people to feel when they walk in this new space? How do you not want them to feel? Um, how do you not want it to look like? You know, um, what is your product saying? How do, how do people interact with it? You know, all the questions that they were going to start thinking about in designing this space. And that's kind of what led us to this theme tonight is finding these truths about when you start or, you know, you embark on a creative project, when you align yourself with a brand as a consumer. Um, and who you are as a person, sort of all in, in that mix. Um, also, Sarah, my good friend and colleague, uh, she has a blog called The Real Authenticity, and she's written quite a few things about branding and people and product and how they all commingle together. And to give credit where credit's due, this is one of the titles of her articles. So I didn't come up with this title, it's all, it's all her. <laughs> it's all right there. Um, so, as Max said, we're, I mean, how many of you guys listen to podcasts? Yeah, me too. I love podcasts. I love listening to industry podcasts, financial podcasts, you know, um, immersive storytelling. I love um, the interview format. I think it's kind of my favorite right now. Mm -hmm. So we thought, you know, that would be fun to kind of play that way. You know, there's something about when you're listening to a podcast uh, in on a conversation you're relating in a different way than you do visually. I mean, of course, you know, there's still that visual aspect because you see us up here and we have a few slides, but so we're gonna just have, you know, I'm probably going to lead Sarah in some questions. Uh, you know, she has a different path than mine that I think could be relevant to talk about and <coughs> as it relates to, to branding and product. Um, but we certainly, if it's not uncomfortable for you, if you have a question or you wanna just shout out, totally organic, we're like, mellow, casual people. Um, and then lastly, before we start, you guys should have all had a little card on your seat. Uh, yes, we brought paper into the universe and it's recycled, but um, we're going old school. But on the back of the card, you will see um, three prompts. And it's an exercise that uh, you probably do on creative projects, but companies will do when they embark on branding and messaging and identity work is, is asking themselves who, who they are. Like, who are we in the marketplace? You know, what, what are we about? What are we saying? Is it authentic? Is it truthful? I mean, we're all really savvy consumers, right? And we can kind of smell a rat away when you're like, well, they're just trying to hop on a campaign and sell me something for a season and then they're out of here. So we really want to explore that. But so this is an exercise for you guys that during the course of this conversation, the goal is to have you answer or fill in. Hopefully you guys all have a pen or a pencil. 
I'm sorry that these should have been on uncoated. <laughs> They're matte, so if you have the pen that's gonna smudge, I'm sorry, that would drive me crazy, but maybe a pencil if anyone, I love pencils. Does anyone still use a pencil? Um, because I also want to say, um, you know, the exercise is to distill it down into one word. So as we're talking tonight, you may, just like the design process, gather ideas. You know, you're sort of in the process of gathering, hmm, what am I, you know, and, and jot them down as we're talking. You don't have to do it right away, but the goal is to hopefully have them filled in before you leave the room tonight. <coughs> you're not handing them into Max, they're purely for you to have. Um, and we're not as, grading? We're not no, grading we're not going to grade them. No grade. But we will ask you for the, the brave ones to stand up and share them with us at the end. Um, you know, the, the I am is probably the mo most difficult to answer because there's probably a lot of options, you know, and, and we define ourselves in different ways. Um, but the idea is to um, try to get to that, you know, on a technicality, you could have two words like I am an artist. It doesn't have, we're not going to be so strict. Um, the, the second prompt, the I am not, this might come really quickly to you because oftentimes we find we know what we don't like, <laughs> more so than what we do. Um, and it's a place also brands will go in, in the space to say, well, we're not that, we're not that, we're not that, but we're that. And it helps them get to the I am. So, you know, the brands that are out there disrupting in the industry, they're doing the, we're not that, we're going this way. So it really serves as a starting off point. So you, you might come to that right away, but it's that preference thing of like, I'm not a pizza person, I'm a Chinese food person, or I'm not a summer person, I'm a fall person. But it really helps you define who you are, you know, from, and, and that's the intention of that prompt. Um, and the last one is the tried and true aspirational, you know, what do I aspire to be? Um, when you guys enter into the marketplace, uh, you know, you're probably going to get the interview question of like, so where do you want to be in three and five years? <laughs> you know, and you know, it's a question of, that's kind of annoying and some people don't want to be that far out, you know, and they don't want to be thinking about, well, what, what is it there that I want to go? Because sometimes it might not, um, the road might change as you're continuing. So, um, but it's always a nice marker to say, this is what I aspire to put my, my lens on right now. And um, these are not static and they will stay with you today, but the goal is, you know, you put them in a journal, you put them in a drawer where you work um, before you start a project and maybe three months, maybe when you graduate, you pull this out and you're like, oh yeah, I remember this talk that we did at Max's class. And, are those words still relevant to you? Do they still have the same meaning when you wrote them tonight? Um, and if they don't, that's kind of the purpose because the evolution of, of what you are and where you're moving is the same thing that brands are doing. They are asking those questions, or should be, to stay relevant because if they're not, they're not innovating and they're not sort of progressing and that's a choice. You know, there are certainly companies, you know, in the business to business market or something that's very like, we make this, we sell this, that's what it's gonna be. But for the companies who want to move forward and I think you guys could name a handful of brands that you know who are doing that, um, they need the stretch goal of like, what do we aspire to be? Where should we be in a year? Where should we be in two years? Where should we be in three years? And those kind of questions. So that is your little exercise for tonight. Um, so I think with that, you wanna start talking? Sure, let's start talking. <laughs> so we are at a university. I know. And uh, it's lovely. We it got lost funny. getting here, by the way. Um, Tell us about, Sarah, like when, what's your educational background? Um, I'm originally from Baltimore. I went to an all-girls prep school back east, and then um, was loved art, visual art, fine arts, and I was not allowed to go to an art school. I was told I had to have a four-year program at a four-year college. So I was a fine arts major at Washington University in St. Louis, where I got my Bachelor of Fine Arts before falling in love with a man and followed him out to Los Angeles, where I ended up staying. Left the guy, but kept the city. And so here is where I here ended up. Here is where you are. Here is where I am. 
I will add that both Sarah and I's background is in brand development, product development in the consumer goods space. The significant difference between Sarah and I, we're not sisters by the way, some people think that we are. Um, <laughs> I have aligned myself with companies and agencies to help them grow. Um, I worked for a startup for many, many years uh, growing that company um, and I've also been on the agency side. Sarah um, has taken a path of where she has started two separate companies. So that's why I'm sort of putting you know, the conversation leaning towards her right now because her I am was different than my I am. You know, you, you I mean, were, when you were in school, did you, was your I am an artist? You know, um, my, you know, I wanted to be a visual artist. I studied graphic design and advertising. And so there was a lot of copywriting and creative brand thinking and jingle writing and all the things that go into the advertising and graphic design world. And so while I loved my sketching and my um, painting uh, classes, I did end up going more in a commercial direction. However, when I came to Los Angeles, I was already obsolete because I, w I had learned all through hand work and very quickly, it was the computer age of learning, learning computer graphics and things of that nature. When I got to Los Angeles, still loving my art, I just naturally gravitated towards the entertainment industry. I think a lot of people, when they get here, it's just a natural place for <coughs> us to go. Um, I ended up working as an internship in a casting company before working at a talent agency, before re being recruited to Simpson Bruckheimer Films, I um, think probably all you guys are familiar with Jerry Bruckheimer, um, before being re from there leaving and working for a fashion designer based in Los Angeles as her executive assistant. Um, and I was doing her fashion show production and doing public relations for it before I knew what PR was. I had somebody say to me, oh, you're her publicist. I'm like, yes. And then I, went, I was like, what the hell is a publicist? Like, what is that? Um, I didn't have Google to look it up, so I was doing what I used to do a lot of, pick up the you phone. You were etching, I was, etching I was, I was, I was, stone. Yeah, I was etching in stone. <laughs> Sending faxes, things of that nature. No, I was just asking people, like, what, what is this? What is this publicist? What is public relations? And so um, from public relations, I, um, what I was doing for um, this very large fashion design company in Los Angeles, a friend of mine who was a fashion stylist who dressed celebrities said, hey, Sarah, what you're doing for this one person, you could be doing for many. And I know of this really cute little boutique agency, and why don't you come over and meet the owner? I think you could do some great things. Um, so I took the meeting, found myself with a new position as a publicist working at a boutique fashion agency before I was recruited again for another company called People's Revolution, which was founded by Kelly Catron. And I don't know if any of you know Hell on Earth or, or any of any of that's probably way way too it was like early one for of you the guys. First fashion, the first reality, fashion reality shows, and she was um, and she, so she made the Kardashians. Oh yeah, she's, <laughs> she's something else. So um, was recruited there, started their fashion division before meeting a like-minded person who wanted to do really good within the Los Angeles design community and really wanted to start telling a compelling story about the amazing talent that is in the city, and so. A uh, friend of mine who had moved out from New York, she had been working for a designer called Vivian Tam in New York for years and years, and she came out, and we started our own agency called SPR, which I um, founded and ran for ten and a half years, and represented many fashion designers. Some brands you may know, like a Superga Sneakers, where I launched in the, United, in the U.S. market. Um, I did hotels and restaurants and spas and fashion designers and we had a really great time of it. So it you great. weren't you weren't doing what you studied no. in school. I was not doing what I studied. Um, the creative sol problem solving in graphic design and in fine arts and the visualization and the compelling storytelling through visuals, as well as the copywriting, I was able to apply all of those talents to telling other people's stories, but doing it through a public relations format as opposed to as, as opposed to through traditional advertising, which is what I was trained to do. Um, a lot of the same talents you would use for one, you use for the other. 
it's just it's it's a different way of, of communicating to a consumer or communicating to an audience. So you know the company that I want to talk about is your second company. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Okay. So after ten and a half years of doing public relations, um, times were changing. And what used to be all return on investment and marketing and product placement and covers of magazines and dressing celebrities for free became a pay-to-play marketplace, which it was the precursor to social media. So the celebrities started charging, everybody wanted had their hands out and said, you have to pay to be in my magazine, you have to pay to be, all of these kinds of things. And I said, you know what, I feel a shift and it's time for me to take a shift. And in all my work around Los Angeles and all the travels that I did and really celebrating our city's creative, which is, is just an amazing, amazing pool of, of talent, I realized that there was a really huge void in the marketplace for modern souvenirs. Things that celebrated the city that. that I love, Los Angeles, um, the way I felt they should be celebrated. So everything, if you walked on Hollywood Boulevard, was everything from the statue that said, you know, the world's best mom that looks like an Oscar to the stars on Hollywood The tchotchkes. The, the, the tchotchkes. And I thought, you know what, there's got to be something better. Why don't, I, why don't I do this? Now, mind you, I've never made anything in my entire life. I mean, I've made paintings, I've done, I've done sculpture, I've done things of that nature, but manufacturing? I've never manufactured anything in my entire life, and I really didn't know the first. But I'm the kind of person who, when I decide I'm going to do something, nobody can tell me that I'm mm -hmm. not going to do it. And so I shared the idea that I had with starting a modern souvenir company celebrating Los Angeles with some people that I thought were tremendous. One in particular is a designer, an architect named Barbara Bester, who had designed my public relations office. And I went to Barbara and I said, I think you epitomize what is really good in LA design um, from, a, from a home standpoint. Is this something you would be interested in participating with me? And she's like, Absolutely. I went to another person who was in sales who had a showroom and who sold gifts uh, to a national and international marketplace. I'm like, I have this idea. This is what I'm thinking. Is this something you'd be interested in? She's like, absolutely. And so I knew if these two people thought it was a good idea, it was a good idea. And so we Did set they tell out. you why they thought it was a good idea? Um, I they mean, thought obviously it, they did, but I'm just curious. Like, they like me. <laughs> no, um, but they liked they, what you were seeing or they, the opportunity. They, on. they saw the opportunity. I did a lot of research on the amount of tourism and the money that was coming into Los Angeles. The amount of money. I mean, L. A. is a multi-billion-dollar brand. It's a brand. L. A. is a brand. All cities are brands, and Los Angeles just happens to be a tremendously desirable brand if you look at it from an international standpoint. The amount of people that are coming in here and bringing their money and spending money in the hotels and the restaurants and our museums and our stores. And it's, it's LA's a, a big business in and of itself and it's aspirational. People from all over the world identify, like look at Los Angeles as a place that they want to visit and they want to, you know, that they want to come to and they want to mm -hmm. aspire to be a part of. And so um, it, it, made, it made sense for so many reasons and we were really at, at the forefront of people looking at cities as brands. Um, and being able to sort of create product around these brands from a much more design aesthetic. One of the first items that we did is we did a series of, of rocks glasses. Um, we did beaches, canyons, and freeways. Um, these, this is our freeway set. This was the one that I discovered. Yeah. Uh, Sarah sold at very elevated retailers. She sold at the Broad. Um, if you guys, it's closed now, but Yoke in uh, Silver Lake. It moved, it's open. It moved. Oh, it moved. Um, but the freeway glasses, you, I don't know if you guys can see from the photo, but the design, um, Sarah included the, it's very small by the number, the, the 5, the 101, the 405. And it, I love the way that it picks up on this very Angelino way that we reference our freeways. I mean, you guys know the SNL skit. And it's like, the Cal Californians. Yeah. And um, yeah. I was visiting a friend up in Oregon last year, and we were kind of navigating, <coughs> navigating around the city, or I was telling her where we should go. And I said, well, it looks like we just need to jump on the five. And she, like, schooled me so many times over, Trish. We don't say the in front of the freeway. Yeah. <laughs> it's just take five to 101 to 10. And it felt so like, what? 
so this is very, I mean, you picked up on those little nuances that are not, I mean, the freeways are our life. But just the fact that it's like it's the it's well, the 405. And we designed and we created for the people who live and love their cities. This was not designed to be a souvenir item, but it lent itself to a super souvenir capacity. One of the important things that we looked at is who did we see ourselves sitting with on the shelves? Like who, not our competition, but who, you know, a retail store carries lots of merchandise. Who did we see ourselves selling with? And so we wanted to be aspirational from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, but we didn't want to be aspirational from a price standpoint. We wanted to be obtainable. And so even within the capacity of, of doing most of our manufacturing in Los Angeles and in the United States, we were able to be in a really competitive marketplace. I mean, that was something that was really important when mm -hmm. you began the brand is manufacturing in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, I, you remember that was part of the messaging. Absolutely. Um, which is not easy to do if you are looking to tell that story of supporting, you know, local supply chains. Well, what was interesting, again, as I mentioned before, I've never manufactured anything. So I had to figure out who's going to make these products for me. So we started doing a lot of creative exploration and mounds of, of creative ideas and designs and collecting images from all over. And um, I started reaching out to people, I mean, by, you know, picking up the phone, doing research online. There's no Alibaba for the United States. Where Do you, you guys know what Alibaba? Do yeah. you know what Alibaba? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you can't go, there's no US Alibaba, which really pisses me off. <laughs> there's Google, wish, there's Google. Well, there's, yeah, but it's a little different because yeah. I wish I could go somewhere and say, I want to find a US manufacturer who's going to make this for me. And there isn't, it doesn't exist. I went as far as to contact Cotton Inc., which is um, an organization that represents <coughs> cotton manufacturers, and I went to them to find towel manufacturers domestically who could potentially do our beach towels for us. Like, it shouldn't be that hard to find people to make things for you in Los Angeles or in California or in the United States, but it can be. It's, it's you know, and Trish yeah, and, and I were talking about- It certainly could be more expensive. It, it's, I mean, it's, where you're losing- It can be more expensive, but I think that the, the it was very important for me to support U.S. manufacturers and to keep the money going and to sort of, I have this, I have this fantasy of having, I live in Silver Lake and if we had a Silver Lake dollar and I could go to my local mm -hmm. store and spend my money and then that money would go over here and that we would just keep recycling our money so that the money stayed in our neighborhood and we kept our neighborhood retail stores going and our, rate, our restaurants and, all, and our babysitters and our dog walkers and everything that we needed. Um, when the money leaves, it's hard to get it back. When the money leaves our neighborhoods or our cities or our states or our country, we don't necessarily see that in return. And so it was very important to find manufacturers that would work with me and they did. And they worked with me on price point and they gave me deals that they wouldn't give a lot of people and they asked me to keep it a secret. But the <laughs> factories that I found to work with, and Trish had the luxury of, of working with one of my factories, my glass manufacturers, where they became family. My fact, like my, I mean, we would celebrate together. We would break bread together. Like I knew about their kids and they knew about my kids. And Which is not the experience when you're producing overseas. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Most but, of the time. But it can be good, but it's usually... And, and it, it has to do with and when you're developing a brand, like what is, what is your authenticity within that brand? What was important to me? That was an important part of my story. That was important for me, for Sisters of Los Angeles, or it was also called So LA. It was really important that I could say to people, this was made here. This was made in Los Angeles. And, um, and it was a very proud part of doing what it was that I did. Mm -hmm. Do you all um, follow brands or uh, are loyal to brands because they produce in the U.S. only? Is that an does important aspect, or does do you guys think about that, or is it you do? Yeah. No, it's it's less it's less than I thought. I thought yeah. that there would be more. Um, it's hard because we are we are in a world of Target. In a world where it's fast and it's cheap and it's Zara and it's, I mean, it's instant gratification and why am I going to pay $15 for something if I can buy it for $1.50? But it has to do with priority as a consumer 
if it's not a priority, then it's <coughs> not a priority. But as a mat as a brand for me, that was the that was a priority. Right. And well, then, and as a consumer, yeah. if you're not in that space about not that you're not caring about the transparency, but if that's not important to you and you're mm -hmm. more, I want to get a ten dollar shirt that I like and be done with it. You know, there's a story that goes along with that in terms of well, where is that being sourced? Is the factory producing that uh, certified and of value? Exactly. Are they hiring uh, labor of age and paying them fairly? Uh, and paying them fairly. So you know, it becomes it's it's a choice. Believe me, I've shopped at Zara. I've I you know, but it's becoming more. There are brands out there, and we'll talk about some uh, in a little bit. Mm -hmm that we really respect that tell this story. That is their truth. That is what they're talking about in terms of backing it up um, and um, supporting that. Now that being said, if there was product that I couldn't find sources to manufacture for me domestically, I had to go overseas. For matches, I couldn't find anybody to make matches for me in the US. I had to go to India. And that's where the matches well, were Well, and made. just to add color to that, like, so Sarah's, the, the brand was really a lifestyle brand, so the rock glasses were a signature item, and I would say one of the best sellers. Yeah. Uh, but, like she said, she, it, she did accessories, she did totes, she did uh, she beach towels, seasonal stuff. So this is just a glimpse, but, so her supply chain was... I had a lot of matches. Challenging, yeah. in the sense, but when you are expanding and looking to tell a story that you know, you did those really cool candles mm -hmm. and bracelets, mm -hmm. and that all tied together, mm -hmm. but behind the scenes, mm -hmm. that was kind of a lot of... <laughs> it's a lot of skews. <laughs> it's a lot of crazy. Um, and the way this actually grew, because our name, I mean, our name was Sisters of Los Angeles, but what started happening is people from other cities, retail stores, and hotels, and, and other, you know, opportunities opened up where they came to me and they said, hey, what you're doing in LA, can you do for us? So, New York, Chicago, the Bahamas, Hawaii, and all of a sudden, what started as a brand that was really focused just on celebrating the city of Los Angeles and sort of in California, be started evolving into uh, celebrating city and state. And our tagline was um, Sisters of Los Angeles, spreading sunshine, happiness, and city pride from coast to coast, is ultimately what we expanded and grew into. Sarah was able, you know, as she was saying, she produced locally and, um, you know, there was the ability to run short runs and that's the big thing when you're overseas that, you know, a minimum run, it's, it's very costly and usually about 2,500 units. And you wait 120 days for the product to come in. Yeah. So, so from the time that you place your order for production and the time you actually receive your goods and depending if it's Chinese New Year in the middle of it all. It's closed down. It's yeah. locked down it's a for different, four it's weeks. It's a different manufacturing yeah. cycle. But because I reference that because yeah. you had the area code. So yeah. she did a series of area codes for 213, 310 for Los Angeles that we know. But as other states and territories started requesting it, she had the ability to do short runs. Um, she wasn't running a print-on-demand model, mm -hmm. but she was able to customize based on a region that then spoke that truth of, oh, you know, you're selling what you're selling in LA, but you're able to do it um, for us. Exactly. In a and, way. And, and it felt very proprietary to retailers because they felt they had something special. So for example, and I, I tend to always reflect back to what I know, which is my neighborhood Silver Lake. When we did our Silver Lake mug, our, one of our, our store partners, our retail partners, because they really were our partners, they were a conduit to our customer because we did a huge wholesale business, is the Silver Lake mug was the, I mean, they would order 100, 144 at a time because it was the go-to place to get this mug. And anybody who was visiting Silver Lake or was living in Silver Lake and wanted to walk away with something, that was the go-to item and they could sell them all day, every day. When we designed and created these things, I didn't design for create for trend. Our product was really happy and colorful and it made people feel good and it made them smile. You could have a, Texas could have a cocktail with New York and Clink and everybody was happy. Um, mm -hmm. But it became very proprietary. It became every, every store that carried our product, it felt unique, it was unique. and special mm -hmm. for them. An Austin glass in an Austin store felt special. 
because it was really focused, the aesthetic and the color palette and the story and the art was very much about that location. And I think that that was one of the things that was really exciting and that was the feedback we were getting from people, that it felt like home and it felt, it felt, they felt connected. It brought people together. It made people feel, if they were missing home, and, the made, you know, and that's how people it, gifted yeah. our product. Because if somebody was like leaving town or they were coming home or they were going off to college, our, per our product was purchased, or if they wanted to save a memory, that's how people purchased our product. They either bought it for themselves or they bought it as gifts for other people that way. Yeah. Actually, I have a question. On the, uh, <laughs> on the authenticity side, yeah. uh, you started out with LA yeah. because that was your experience. How did you dig into the experience of Austin or Buffalo? Well, a lot of, I mean, the area codes was, it was very obvious because that was, that was sort of the numbers. But when we were doing our city art and our creative art in that way, a lot of times we would work with our retailers and they would told us, and, or, and they would tell us what is important to them. What is important to you in your city? What do you want your city to reflect? And we listened to them and we created art that way. And then we would do a lot of research of our own as well. We don't have any of our city wrap. Oh, you can see what our Malibu and our Laurel looks like. You can see like. a little bit, yeah. So the color palettes were very reflective of that area. And then we would send them the art before we manufactured. And we would say, this is what we've come up for your city. How do you feel about this? So it was a collaborative experience. We were not, we were not, we were not dictatorial in that regard. Some of our product when we did the state of collection where it was the Golden State or the Empire State for New York or the Lone Star State for Texas, that all sort of was very systematic, same with the area codes. But when it came to that kind of art, the scape art, it was very individualized and very customizable. And that's why it resonated for people. But yet if you look at the all states collected, it felt cohesive. Oh yeah, it, because it has a fingerprint. It had a point of view. Yeah. You could tell our product, you always knew it was Sisters of Los Angeles, even though we always had our watermark on it because you know you want to, but it was uh, for our branding You want to have your brand on yeah, it? Yeah, I got to have your brand on it. <laughs> um, but it was, it felt, it felt precious to them. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you another question and I totally blanked on it. Um, or cheat sheet? You want cheat sheet? No, I mean, I, w I want to talk about relevance. Okay. I mean, y you, you know, you created this, you saw a, a, a need, mm -hmm. or, or maybe it wasn't a need, but you saw a void. A void in the market, yeah. Um, I mean, how did you sort of move into how is this relevant? I mean, because you were speaking to, like you said, you weren't necessarily speaking to tourists, mm -hmm. you were speaking to residents, mm -hmm. to local people that would understand the sort of wink wink insider mm -hmm. or that's meaningful to me. Um, but Well, bec our, our product was designed to not be trend oriented. Um, we wanted to create staples, we wanted to create something that could live today and it could live 10 years from now and it still felt it still felt, it, unless the skyline changed, which that happens sometimes, but it still felt like it resonated with people. And because we were not chasing trends, we weren't, I mean, we weren't chasing after things that other people were doing that we, like if somebody else was doing it, we didn't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. You were like, that's my not. That's not, that, you yeah. know, people would say to me all the time, we'll do our zip code. No, other people do zip codes. I'm not doing zip codes. I do area codes. You want zip codes? Go to the other <laughs> person and do the zip codes. <laughs> but, but the truth be told is the way we were always, we were very true to ourselves. We knew, I, I knew wh who, what this brand was and I knew who our audience was. And I knew that we were not there to speak to everyone, to sell to everybody. We were not, we are not, if, if it, peop, some people thought we were too expensive, I never thought a $15 mug was too expensive, but if you thought it was too expensive for your store, guess what? Don't carry it. It's not for you. It's not for your store and it's not for your audience. And I appreciate that. We knew who we were. We knew the story we were trying to tell. We wanted to make people feel good. We want to make people feel like they belong. Um, Which is quite different on larger brands who want to be mass distributed 
and when they get feedback on I won't pay fifteen dollars that's retail that's not okay. wholesale uh, oftentimes brands will lower that price and it sort of eats into the value of your brand um, and that's a, a decision you know what type of product are you putting out there is it novelty is it kind of like a quick pickup at the cash register or is it something coveted that you can really say no this is you know um, $89 and there's a reason for that and um, but you you do have to back up the story of of why uh, you know and also the quality and we everything did, else that goes into we it. Did, we did Golden State sweatshirts and I can't even tell you how many of these sweatshirts but they were also made in Los Angeles. The sweatshirts were made in Los Angeles. They were, good they were screened in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. They were or they were they were foil printed in Los Angeles. It was all done in Los Angeles. One of the things that we talk about is like like those glasses, nine people touch those glasses. Nine human beings, not conveyor belts, not, you know, automation. Nine people touch those glasses. And I would take great pride in being able to tell my stories that. Like you realize that nine people benefited or there, you know, whether it was the factory worker, whether it was the person who helped me pack it, the person who picked up from Federal Express, the person who dropped off from Federal Express, the person who actually created the screens for the, the person who ran the screens and hand silk screened these. Nine people touched this glass, and I think that when you're, when you're thinking about, and when you're thinking about like the questions that we ask and things like that and who we are, whether it's you as a person or whether you're looking at a brand and you're thinking, you know, who, who, what is this brand about? You know, these are the things that were important to me and were gonna help me keep my brand authentic and true to itself and our story pure and compelling and made it, made people feel good about their purchase. It wasn't, you know, anybody, anybody can make, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of shit out there. <laughs> there's a lot of product out there. And the, the, you have to differentiate your product. And this is how I chose to differentiate this product. I used to help a lot of brands tell their story and find their positioning within the marketplace because you can't own the whole market. You only, you have to figure out what piece of that pie you can own and you can be the best damn piece of that pie you can be. And you can own that, that story. And this was how I chose to tell this story. That's cool. Thanks. Um, do you guys have any questions before we're going to move on? Oh, okay, Max. Go Max. Hi, Max. Um, you in a white shirt. Yeah, in a white shirt. The, uh, did you find that having more value built into the actual objects that there was a level of sustainability built into this? Was that a part of the equation that these were less throw away, that there would be more precious objects, sort of thing? Um, we didn't do anything that was to be thrown away. Nothing we did was disposable. The whole, again, the idea was these are, you know, these were almost collectibles in this regard. Um, we were careful about our packaging. All of our packaging was made in Los Angeles and it was made of recycling materials and it was to be recycled. The packaging was I love packaging, and I'm big on packaging, but our packaging was not about the packaging. It was, it was to house it, to make sure it was safe and things of that nature. We weren't selling the packaging, we were selling what was inside. It complemented the product, though, I think quite lovely. It was it really downplayed, uh, um, because that's not where we wanted to spend our money. Um, but I think that as far as from a, a sus, sus, you know, I mean, we were a sustainable product in the regard of the fact that this was not disposable. I mean, unless you drop it on the unless floor. Unless you drop it on the floor. Like yeah, don't drop it on the, on the floor. <laughs> Great. Um, so, you know, when Sarah and I were talking about sisters and just the, mm -hmm. the idea of being relevant and either chasing trends or how do you stay relevant without chasing trends, um, there is a, uh, they're an international brand consulting firm um, and they produce this uh, brand relevance index every year. Uh, they're called Profit. And um, they survey like over 13,000 consumers, they're US based only, about uh, brands. And so they do this ranking of like the top 50 brands 
in the U.S. for each year, and they've been doing this for, I think, four, four or five years. And um, the thing that they narrow in on that I think is interesting is um, the brands that rank in this 50 all share these common themes about how they shape their stories. Um, you know, they're all customer obsessed. I mean, from our point of view, it's brands that we cannot live without. They're so integrated as part of our life that we, um, we don't know what it would be like not to have it. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about <laughs> as one of them. Um, pragmatic, um, brands that we depend on and what they do, they're consistent and they do it well. Um, inspirational, uh, you know, um, that could be uh, important to you or that could be less important to you. You know, it's the brands that we feel emotionally tied to that um, give us some sort of personal value that could be different than your friend, you know, that doesn't find the same inspiration from it. And then innovation we kind of touched upon that, you know, these are companies that are constantly having the conversation of how can we, you know, solve the next problem for our customer? Or what is the pain point that they have now? Or, uh, you know, where should we be so that we can stay in the I am zone versus the oh, shit, we missed that boat, I'm, I'm the not. Um, so before I go to the next slide, there, we'll reveal the top 50, but so the top five, any guesses? I mean, number one. Just Apple. shout out. Coca-Cola. Who said Apple? That's like a no-brainer, good. But two, three, four, and five, any others? Nike. Amazon. Nike, Amazon. Disney. Disney. Anyone else? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. Adidas. And Adidas. I love Adidas, but they weren't in the top five. <laughs> but again, this is annual, and it does change, because I actually look back to see what was a top five in 2018, and it moves based mm -hmm. on you know, these themes and the perception um, of the consumer. And I will say that last year, Amazon was in the top five, but they're not in the top five this year. And that could be many different reasons, and they're controlling the market in so many ways, but, you know, people are now used to Prime. Everybody has it. It's not that unique anymore. Their interface, let's be honest, like that whole experience <laughs> It's not very interesting. And certainly with other online experiences, Amazon just doesn't put their, uh, their money in that experience. They're doing other things. So it's interesting that they, don't have they were in the top five. They're in the top 50. I'll just give you that <laughs> much. But so um, some of you were right. So the number one Apple, that is just, they've been in that spot and probably will be till the end of time until the world blows up. Um, number two is Spotify. No one said Spotify, but Spotify's done a really great job about building a community for their listeners. And I think that's what's resonating and what's relevant. I mean, it's easy to find friends. It's easy to see what they're listening to, to make playlists. Um, they're doing a lot of interesting things with content and building out um, you know, their, their properties in a way that um, I think customers are responding to. Um, the third one, Android. I think this is a new uh, brand logo that they did a year or two ago. Um, Bose may seem like an older brand you, and they are, but I think it's there because of the quality and consistency of their products. I mean, they are always, um, you know that they're going to bring the best to the table, and you know they will always innovate. Um, and the fifth one, Disney. Someone <coughs> said Disney. Mm -hmm. Why did you say Disney? They're both nostalgic and inspirational, something you can always look back at. And we all know, right? It's, I mean, we're of different ages, but we all have grown up with Disney, whether that's going to the amusement park, visiting the hotels, um, you know, uh, watching the old, old and new films. Mm -hmm. um, but what's interesting about Disney is they're a very mature company. They're a brand that has been there for the end of time. So to them to ask the question of how are we still relevant? I mean, you know, they're relevant by producing content and doing all these things that they've been doing for years, but you all know that Disney's gonna be launching a streaming service next month. So they're launching Disney Plus, 
And that's their answer to look within the competitive space and to say, this is how we're going to be relevant. We're going to represent this space and the way that people interact with us, our customers know us. And so they're going to go up against Netflix and they're entering into that. I mean, they're so large, but you know, they didn't have to. They didn't have to go there. They could continue doing and creating and, and you know, being this wonderful company, but they're, they're, um, they men made the number five spot. So. The uh, 50 are here, and some of these may surprise or not, but when I looked at this and I think through the lens of like, what can I not live without? What's my brand? NPR for sure. I mean, that's a really great, um, this is part of my life. I mean, I turn that on every morning. I can't, there. Did you, do you guys listen to it? And you know that, you know, they do their fundraising. Are you guys NPR listeners? Sort of. <laughs> okay, we won't go I'm a, I'm an NPR listener. First. Thank you. Okay. okay anyway. um, Trader Joe's, you guys shop at Trader Joe's. <laughs> or no. Jeez, you guys, where do you shop? What brands on here surprise you? Tesla. Tesla? Yeah. Why? Do you have a Tesla? I wish I had a Tesla. Because <laughs> you could drive it to Trader Joe's. Do you know they're going to they're going to make them affordable in the next couple of like they're That's they're dropping they're, they're getting. They're getting there. They will. Yeah. But what, like, what else do you relate to up here? Yeah. YouTube? They're doing all sorts of things to make you all happy. <laughs> Keep coming back. So it's just interesting to look at. This will shift next year, you know, and there will be different players in the, um, not, not much. Apple will still be there, of course. But, you know, what Amazon will do, Netflix, you know, what's going to happen there. Um, so just interesting to uh, mm -hmm. examine. Um, so Sarah and I also wanted to talk about, you know, I asked her, well, this is the top 50, but what do, what do we think brands that we like mm -hmm. and what they're talking about and their truth? And I asked Sarah to pick one and mm -hmm. you asked me to pick one. Mm -hmm. And you guys may or may not know this brand, but this was your choice, mm -hmm. right? Choice. Um, does anybody know Kiehl's? Okay. So okay. Kiehl's. <laughs> so Kiehl's has been around since 1851. Um, what resonates for me about this brand is they do what they say they're going to do. Their price points, the fact that the product hasn't changed, their formulas are consistent since day one all the way through. Their, their packaging. Their packaging. Looks, I mean, I discovered them in the <coughs> 90s in New York, mm -hmm. and they were very yeah. bare bones, and that was, the, I think, the mystique yeah. about it. And, but mm -hmm. this is what the packaging looked yeah, like 30, 30 years ago. Yeah. And um, I think they do good, does, I think they do good quality product. It's, it's you know, I, I think they do, I mean, it's, for me, it's a personal preference. I like the brand. I like their. I like their ethos. I like the fact that I can take back the packaging into their retail stores, and I can return it and get points for free product. I like the fact that I can test every product at home in the comfort of my own home before I actually make a purchase. And I like the fact that they are completely, completely transparent when it comes to their uh, the piece the items that they're using the. Um, their formulas and what their ingredients are. I appreciate that. They give back to charity and they are transparent with regards to what they actually, what the organizations. So if you click on any of those boxes on their website, it'll tell you where that money's going. Um, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that I, it's, a, it's a product that is dependable and it's trustworthy. And I think they do good work. Um, in th about, I think it was in 2000 yeah, they 2001, were they were purchased by L'Oreal, and they were able to maintain through that purchase a consistency in their messaging and their storytelling and their product, which to me says a lot. It says a lot on both sides. It says a lot for L'Oreal to allow that brand to be able to continue and to do their good work and to do what it is that they do, and it says a lot on the brand that they were able to maintain that at the same time. Well, they it would had, almost kill them if they tried to change yeah. it and alter what they yeah. had established. And we were talking on the way over because they have gotten into CBD. And just like any of the other ingredients they're using, so if they're using a lavender, if they're using um, a chamomile or some of these other natural materials, the CBD has similar you know, properties where it, 
it calms angry skin. It does exactly what you think it you would do. You guys don't know what angry skin is. No, yet. you don't you're know what young. angry skin is. You're too young. <laughs> but, um, but the fact that they were able to go there and they were able to do it in an authentic way that is true to their own brand. They didn't compromise Kiel's branding to go down that path and they did it with dignity and with grace and they and the product itself is is really good. It is really good. Mm -hmm. um, my brand that I chose uh, is a brand called Everlane. Does anybody know Everlane? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Everlane is really great and I uh, have been a fan since they launched um, a while back. They're a San Francisco based company and what appealed to me about it in the very beginning was being in the a fashion space, the way that they marketed themselves, the photography, uh, the design of the clothing was very simple. I mean there was um, kind of a no-nonsense about it but yet it was still stylish in the way that they represented it. But more importantly they immediately started telling the story of my truth of being an ethical company being radically transparent and having quality goods and walking the consumer through that path so there was no curtain that was shut after they sort of threw out a campaign and then you thought oh well this is really wonderful you really understand their challenges of what they're going through as a business to say we want to have ultimately zero carbon footprint in the products that we design and that means in every aspect that we can do. They have uh, on their Instagram stories they have what's called Transparent Tuesdays and you can email in questions if you're curious about any aspect of the business and they actually have the real employees that work there, I think a couple days ago it was their supply chain manager and they had field questions that had already come in but they have her on camera and, and answering, you know, you had asked about this and this is, you know, and talking about uh, what their, their reach goal is to ultimately get to this, you know, zero carbon footprint and talked about the challenge of like the sweater category because some of the factories use polyester in their knit to hold the knitting tighter um, and that's just challenging. It's challenging from a cost perspective but they have areas on their site where they'll actually break down, you know, it costs this, this is what shipping is, this is a, and this is your end price that we're going to charge you versus and then we're going to charge you, you know, $900 which fashion will do that. You know, they build the brand so that they think, you know, you're getting something, but they're really about putting where, you know, their truth and what their story is. Um, and, you say something? and the fact that they're direct to consumer, they don't wholesale. Mm -hmm. So they're able right. to control every part of their story. There's no, you know, intermediate space for them to live. It is direct to consumer online and then they're setting up their own individual retail stores. Which as well. you make more money at that, yeah. Um, they made a move uh, last year into um, a sub-brand called Tread and uh, it's a sustainably built designed sneaker, trainers they call them, but I really love, I guess traditional sneakers, the soles are plastic um, predominantly and they're making a move to have that material be rubber, they're working with factories that use less electricity, less water in producing it. So they're really, you know, it shows that, that brands and companies can expand. They're not stuck in this, oh my God, I, we can only produce in this way. It takes more work, it takes a lot of work, but if this is gonna be your story and the way that you're gonna market and get people on board to be loyal uh, customers over time, this is why I, purchase from them. This is important to me. This is, this, this is meaningful to me and they do it in a, a beautiful way. I mean their creative direction, their marketing, their tone of voice, um, they're real and they give you that behind the scenes look where this company is authentic. Mm -hmm. um, and you know not, you know if you start looking maybe through a different lens after tonight or if you haven't already you know you can start to see sort of the ones that are kind of trying to pull the wool over your eyes or sort of just do it on a trend basis or for a promotional reason because it's Valentine's Day. Um, so uh, this was my brand. It's a good brand. Wrapping up, but okay. uh, so Sarah and I are gonna share our, we did the same exercises we're actually asking you to. She made me do to. it. She made me do she it. She made me do it. But I think she I went first, yeah? You went first, yeah. Okay. 
Um, so these are my truths, and I, I have to say I changed mine a few times. It was kind of not difficult, but again, where I am today, these wouldn't be my words last year. Um, but I know that I am a collaborator. I am at my best when I'm working with people. I'm exchanging ideas. I love working with new people entering into the workforce. Yeah, oh, thanks. Um, and it, that's very important to me. That um, that is that is uh, a word that I identify with. Um, I am not egotistical. That does not mean that I don't have an ego. We all have egos, and they drive us in ways that can be productive. I think if you understand how ego can perform in your work, you know it's. It's getting to know how it operates and when it can be a friend or when it's really a negative driver. So um, I've worked on that over the course of my career, so um, I, am, I am not egotistical. And I aspire to be thoughtful. Um, this goes into my personal life, but also professionally, my work, you know, to be thoughtful about what I'm doing. Uh, whatever that may be, um, that is what I aspire to do. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, sort of self-care out there, and a lot of people are getting on this bandwagon talking about being in the moment. And um, so that is that is my mm -hmm. aspiration for me. Ready? You're on. Okay. So um, so this is my truth. Um, I'm a connector. I I'm a problem solver. I connect people, I help people bring their visions and dreams to fruition. Um, if I don't have an answer, I would find somebody that does have an answer. And um, that is something I take a tremendous amount of pride in doing, whether I'm doing it for myself or I'm doing it for friends or colleagues or strangers. Um, it is something that's very important to me. Um, I am not selfish. I like to share. If I have, we were talking about, the, if I have a cookie. <laughs> I would eat the I was, whole thing. She'd eat the whole thing, I would oh, share no. my cookie. I'd share I, with you. I know you would. <laughs> um, I believe there's enough for everybody. And I feel that being, I, I find, I, you know, I think that I want to be able to give. I don't, you know, I don't have to take it all for myself. There's, there's enough for it to go around. And then I aspire to be happy. I, I mean, I think every day, you know, happy's hard. Like, that's a hard <laughs> thing. To, isn't that terrible? But I think happiness is, is hard for people. And I think that I have a 19-year-old son and a 14-year-old daughter. And happy's hard. Like, it's, it's different than it used to be. And information is out there. And it's intense all the time. And you're being bombarded. Like, I mean, I, like, I can't have my cell phone sleep but it can't be in my room with me when I sleep because all night long I'm like thinking what is coming on like what is coming through the screens so I forever aspire to be happy I want to be good do good things and feel good and help people and be happy you're such a good person Aww, thanks Trish I think the same about you <laughs>